Because the aldol and Claisen condensations are such important reactions, I'd like to guide you through a couple of examples of mechanism and synthesis problems involving these two reactions. These problems will involve reactions from previous classes, so would be excellent exam level questions. First, let's work through the mechanism of this multi-step transformation. Don't let the number of steps intimidate you. We'll work through them one by one. If we combine cyclohexanone and excess diethyl carbonate in the presence of sodium ethoxide, what happens? Well, ethoxide is a base, and the only reasonably acidic protons in either of these two molecules are the alpha protons on the ketone. Diethyl carbonate isn't even enolizable. Even though we only make a tiny quantity of the nucleophilic enolate, it is swimming in a sea of electrophiles. Since diethyl carbonate is present in excess, that's the most likely electrophile for it to react with, rather than a molecule of unenolized ketone. The enolate donates into pi star CO of the ester and creates a tetrahedral intermediate, which collapses by a lone pair push to kick out a good leaving group, here, ethoxide. We've produced a beta dicarbonyl compound, so this is the Claisen reaction. And we know that the Claisen reaction is only favorable when a proton between the two carbonyl groups can be deprotonated. So the next step, which drives the whole reaction forward, is deprotonation here, which is essentially complete. That is, all of the starting material has been converted to this enolate. And step one is done. Normally, we finish a Claisen condensation with an H plus workup to protonate exactly where we just deprotonated. But there's no reason we can't replace that step with another reagent that will react at that site. And an alkyl halide that's a good SN2 electrophile, like methyl iodide, will do just fine. This is enolate alkylation and step two is complete. Next, we toss in sodium hydroxide, which hydrolyzes the ester and takes it all the way to the carboxylate. Step three is complete. Finally, HCl protonates the carboxylate, giving us a beta-keto acid, which when heated, undergoes decarboxylation by this unique set of curved arrows moving in a cyclic fashion. Decarboxylation produces an enol, which tautomerizes rapidly under the acidic conditions of the reaction to produce our ketone product. And step four is complete. So maybe you're thinking, why might a chemist go through all these steps rather than just using LDA followed by methyl iodide? LDA is that dangerous. You have to have a pretty high-tech lab to safely work with LDA. Minus 78 degrees Celsius, air-free, water-free conditions. But this complex sequence of reactions is all quite manageable, even in the simplest of labs. You just need a few cheap reagents, a few flasks, and a hot plate. Okay, let's work through a synthesis question. When you're presented with a synthesis question, you should always try to approach it retrosynthetically working backward from the products. Ask yourself, what could this product have been made from? The product shown here has quite a few more carbons than the starting material, so we know we're going to need to make some new carbon-carbon bonds. And there's a ring in the product, so there's going to be at least one intramolecular reaction somewhere. But let's not get carried away. Let's work backward, step by step. The first thing about the product that jumps out at me is the two bromines on adjacent carbons. That arrangement comes from the bromination of an alkene with Br2. Now we're down to mostly carbons and hydrogens, so it seems reasonable that the next retrosynthetic step is to break a carbon-carbon bond. And I know how to do that at an alpha carbon by enolate alkylation. And I know how to make a carbon-carbon bond at the beta carbon by the addition of dialkyl lithium cuprates 
to alpha beta unsaturated carbonyls. So I could have alkylated this enolate with allyl bromide, and this enolate would have come from addition of dibenzyl lithium cuprate to this alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl compound. And we recently learned that alpha beta unsaturated carbonyl compounds come from aldol reactions. The retrosynthetic bond breakage looks like this. The alpha carbon used to be an enolizable position, and the beta carbon used to be a ketone or aldehyde. Lo and behold, this is the starting material we were given. Now we just need to put this together in the forward direction with all the appropriate reagents. The intramolecular aldol reaction just requires a base catalyst. We'll choose sodium methoxide. Then we add dibenzyl lithium cuprate, which makes an enolate. It's an ionic intermediate, so I don't need to draw it in a synthesis problem. And then we follow that with allyl bromide to make this compound. Finally, treatment with Br2 turns the alkene into a dibromide, and we've made our product.